radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. Listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Radio for the masses. Uh, yeah, man. How you doing? How you doing? All right. Fade to black. Today's Monday. Monday, October 25th, 2021. 297 days into the new year, only 68 days left. We are live from a bunker somewhere in the middle of nowhere, a total undisclosed location. But it is beautiful. It is. I would like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States. Hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. This is Fade to Black for KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and UnX. Get X'd. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. What is cracking, everybody? How you doing? How you doing? All right. It's Halloween week. Yeah. Here we go. Here we go. It is Halloween week. And uh, I've got two. I've got two favorite holidays. Well, three. You got to count Christmas. But um, uh, uh, Thanksgiving, right? Christmas. Halloween. (laughs) Yeah, man. Halloween. It's coming up now. Uh, This week on Fade to Black. Tonight. Craig Campobasso is with us. He is here to discuss his new book. It is called The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. There it is right there. And uh, the links for this are over at uh, jimmychurchradio.com. We have it up on the website. All of his links are there. But uh, you can go and get your own copy, illustrated, Amazing book. I have it here. We'll be talking about this tonight. Also, we're going to talk about Dune. Yeah. Did you see Dune over the weekend? I watched it twice. Watched it once uh, by myself and uh, got all set up. Pizza, popcorn, drinks, and uh, went through it. The next day, my uh, daughter, Nicole, stopped by. Uh, That was on Saturday, and we had lunch and watched it a second time. And she, I mean, ever since she was really little, um, I'm talking about like two years old. I'm not, she's 26 now today. And she watched Dune constantly, had the videotape. I'd put her to bed. She's two years old, three years old. She's in her bedroom. And I would hear, she would get up and put in the videotape. And and watch it. It's the year ten one ninety one, and uh, and one one night I was like, is she is she she was like three, you know, three years old. And I went and I stood outside of her bedroom door and I'm listening to her 
speak the dialogue of the movie as it was being spoken. She was tiny. She was so tiny. I just poked my head in and she's lying there sideways watching the movie. <laughs> and and, and uh, so it was so cool to have her come up on, on Saturday and watch the new version of Dune. I wanted she, nobody knows the movie as well as she does uh, the David Lynch version. And, uh, and it passed. She loved it. She absolutely loved it. So that was my weekend. I had a great weekend. So Craig Campobasso is on with us tonight. The reason why I'm bringing up Dune, he worked on Dune with David Lynch for four years. So we're going to talk about Dune tonight, too, as well as his new book, The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. Tomorrow night right here, it is Halloween Ghost Stories with Jim Harold. That's right. Yeah, I can't wait for that. Jim Harold is with us tomorrow night. Halloween Ghost Stories. Wednesday night is our annual. This is our eighth, I believe. This is our eighth annual Halloween special with Shaw the Loon Witch. All right, so your phone calls, your readings all night long. That's going on Wednesday night. It's a huge night for us here on Fade to Black. And uh, I, I just got a chance to meet and hang out with Shaw in Laughlin, Nevada, a couple of months ago. It was uh, so amazing uh, to, to just hang out with her for a week, and she was there. So she'll be with us on Wednesday night. Thursday night is a very special fader night. We're going to do open lines, but Race Hobbs is joining us to announce the UnX Network. So he's going to come in, and I'll probably talk Race into uh, hanging out and taking some phone calls and doing some stuff. And there you go. Now, also in preparation uh, for Shaw, the show may sound a little different to you tonight. I hope that everybody's happy with it. I uh, took out my old console, and uh, which was a new console. Um, it was a Yamaha that's now leaning over here against the wall. I reinstalled my my one of my Mackies and. I just love the sound of this board. I just, I just do. And so in, in doing that, everything got installed. Everything was working. I didn't go back and check audio. I didn't, I didn't do anything. Uh, I reinserted the compressors. And so it just may sound a little bit different. I'll dial it in over uh, the next few days, but uh, I, I just love the sound of this console. It is so warm and so nice. So anyway, um, if it sounds a little bit different, uh, that's what is going on. And, and I'm looking, the levels seem like they're a little low, even though they're cranking or cranking in my headphones and stuff. So I don't know. Uh, everything is set and is correct, but, uh, moving on, I'll dial it in over the next couple of days. Okay. Um, now, uh, where, where was I going with that? Oh, I was having issues, and I don't know why, uh, with the other console. When I brought in two guests, one couldn't hear the other. One guest could hear everything. The other guest could only hear me and not the other guest. And that's one of the reasons why. Is that this is a big deal with Shaw coming in on Wednesday. So I just pulled the trigger, reinstalled uh, the Mackie, and I've got... Uh, uh, it should we shouldn't have any issues okay so well i'm gonna test it before shaw's on the show but uh there you go okay uh where am i at i will be at the starworks usa ufos all the above and beyond conference coming up this november 12th through the 14th in laughlin nevada at the aquarius hotel and casino great great hotel great facility great people there and uh, Jacques Vallée is going to be there. Paul Hynek, I can't wait for that. Colin Andrews, Grant Cameron's going to come in uh, live uh, teleconference. Jaime Musan's going to be there. Ten other amazing speakers come and hang out with us. And uh, tickets and info are over at StarWorksUSA.com. Just click on the links below. You can do that. There's links all throughout social media. Go and get your tickets, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. I can't believe it. Yes, literally in a couple of weeks, right there in Laughlin, Nevada. I had something else I wanted to add to that, and now I, I can't remember what it was. Power went out today, and, uh, oh, oh, okay. 
Anyway, back to <laughs> power went out today and these storms are rolling in. I heard the thunder and, and I was working. I was talking to Ray Hobbs on the phone and uh, talking about this week and, and what's going on over at UNX. Very excited about that. And race, uh, I sent him a picture of the console. He sent me a picture of his Mackie, and we were comparing Mackies. And he goes, oh, look at the flashlight on the thing. I said, yeah, man, I got flashlights everywhere, flashlights. You never know when the power is going to go out. Hung up the phone, power went out. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I, I really couldn't believe it. And then I got these notices on my phone, and uh, one from the Internet company and one from the city saying that uh, power would be restored in, in a few hours and the internet would be back up between 4 and 5 o'clock. And that was in the middle of the afternoon. I was like at 12 noon. I was freaking out. I was freaking out. But everything came back. Everything is fine. You can follow me on Twitter at J Church Radio. Start right there at J Church Radio. Twitter lit up over the weekend at J Church Radio. Hashtag F2B is the sandbox. Uh, a couple of things. There was a Bill Nelson with this interview that he did, I think, with the University of uh, Virginia, talking about extraterrestrial visitation to here on Earth. It was a pretty incredible interview. That was done on October 19th. University of Virginia uh, published it on their YouTube channel on the 20th. And I went back and watched the entire interview. There was only 1,500 views on on their YouTube channel at that time. And I'm freaking out. So I took it. I put it out there on social media. But I also ran a live video. Uh, I think this was on Saturday morning. Was it Saturday or Sunday? And put that up on Twitter. And, and I just watched everything unfold and uh, pretty incredible, pretty incredible statements by Bill Nelson. I'll get to more on that in just a minute. And, uh, and then I was sent uh, from Lori Wagner. I hope she's listening right now. Um, uh, these three pictures from Skinwalker Ranch that were taken last night. And I published those. I don't know what's going on. And looking at the three photographs, it looks like lasers from the ground. That's and especially in one of those pictures. That's what it looks like. And I'm thinking because they are filming a TV show up there right now, maybe, I don't know, but maybe this is something that the production was doing from the ground and, and they're shooting video. They're doing the TV show and I don't know, maybe they're making contact with something up there, but uh, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I guess we're going to have to wait until the series premieres and the new season but they certainly got their marketing dollar. That was some free publicity uh, coming from uh, the sandbox. And uh, so I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, let's get to the breaking news. Blue Origin, Boeing, Sierra Space, and several other partners announced today that they plan to build a commercial off-Earth outpost space station called Orbital Reef, which is scheduled to be up and running by the late 2020s. Orbital Reef's Envision customers include national governments, private industry, and space tourists. Project team members announced everything today. Now, the outpost will be initially complement, uh, but eventually take the baton from the International Space Station, the ISS, which is expected to be retired in 2028 to 2030. Today's announcement comes just four days after NanoRax, Voyager Space, and Lockheed Martin unveil plans for their own private station called Star Lab. And Houston company Axiom Space had previously announced its intention to launch modules into the ISS beginning in 2024. They eventually detach and operate them as free-flying commercial outposts. Wow. Big deal. The first planet outside of our Milky Way galaxy may have been detected for the first time. This result using NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory opened up a new window to search for exoplanets at greater distances than ever before. The possible exoplanet candidate is located in the spiral galaxy Messier 51, otherwise known as M51. 
also called the Whirlpool Galaxy because of its distinctive profile. Now, here is a tip for all of the astronomers of the world. Every star in the universe has a planet. They do. Now go and find them. Name them. You're welcome. NASA is now targeting February 2022 for the launch of the SLS, the most powerful launch system ever, the Space Launch System. Stacked with the agency's Orion crew capsule, the SLS is 332 feet tall and currently sits at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. SLS will launch the next generation of deep space operations, including Artemis missions on and around the moon. It was initially slated to take off next month in November, but has run behind schedule. NASA said in a Friday release that the integrated system is entering the final phase of preparations for an upcoming uncrewed flight test around the moon, including a series of integrated tests. This is the first rocket launch to the moon since Apollo. That's right. Now, I'm going to leave you with this. A private, anonymous U.S. collector has bought the fossilized remains of Big John, the largest Triceratops dinosaur ever discovered. He paid $7.74 million at a Paris auction last Thursday. Big John, named after the owner of the land where the dinosaur's bones were found, roamed modern-day South Dakota more than 66 million years ago. All right, let's get the show cracking. Happy birthday to today. Katy Perry is 36. Man, Adam Goldberg today is 50. I love Adam. And let's let's just go with his two best films. Dazed and Confused, he's amazing in that, and Saving Private Ryan. Oh, that's one of the best death scenes <laughs> ever. The voice of Bart Simpson, Nancy Cartwright, today is 64. Red Hot Chili Pepper Chad Smith is 59. Judas Priest, Guitar God, Glenn Tipton, today is 74. Scorpions guitar god Matthias Jabs today is 65. I don't think anybody wore striped spandex better than Matthias Jabs. I'm going on the record. Also, guitarist Robbie McIntosh today is 64. Our dead guy's birthday today is Helen Reddy. 1941 to 2020, died at the age of 79. Helen was one of the greatest voices in music history. During the 1970s, she had huge international success, especially in the United States, where she placed 15 singles, 15, on the top 40 of Billboard's Hot 100. She made the top 10, uh, 10 times and three reach number one, including her signature hit, of course, I Am Woman. Helen died on September 29, 2020, here in Los Angeles at the age of 78. Oh, 79, 78, 79. She suffered from Addison's disease and dementia in her later years, but no cause of death was given. Happy birthday, Helen Reddy. On this day in history, OTD, 1983, it went down. The United States invades the small Caribbean island of Grenada. They did it with 6,000 troops, 6,000 Marines to be exact, overthrowing the Marxist government there in about four days. <sighs> yeah. Fader fact. Every year. Okay, now listen to me. I, I checked this out. I personally vetted this. I had heard about it in the past, but here's your fader fact. Every year on Good Friday, Filipino Catholic devotees are voluntarily, non-lethally crucified. That's right. 
sterilized nails are driven through their hands and feet. One man has been crucified 33 times. And that is your fader fact. Go check out the pictures. It's crazy. Crazy. I would... Would you rather listen to an entire album of Helen Reddy's Las Vegas years or chop off your little finger? No, man, Helen Reddy rocked. Brian, you are so wrong. Closet Crush of the Day, Katy Perry. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. All right. No, Helen Reddy was cool, man. Helen Reddy had pipes. All right. Now, um, River Moon Coffee. RivermoonWellness.com. Today, because it's thunderstorm, it's raining right now. Thunderstorms, cold, windy. So today I started making mochas. Mm. That's a River Moon Coffee mocha. Mm. Oh, my goodness gracious. All right. Rivermoonwellness.com. Visit our Amazon store. It's right there. The links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. You can also go to the website and, and get the best coffee in the world, Fade to Black Blend. Also get the Game Changer Blend. Um, this weekend, you know, I just moved into this uh, house. Well, I've been here now for for about three months. And uh, still unpacking and, and doing things. And I started to um, fill up my shoe racks in the uh, master closet, in the walk-in closet. So I set up the shoe racks, you know, across the bottom of the closet floor. And it's probably, I mean, the whole thing is probably, uh, the shoe rack itself is about 12 feet. Yeah, I know it sounds pretentious, but I got a lot of shoes. So, um and, you know, so I set up the shoe racks and and I'm unboxing shoes still, right? Okay, and they're 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 coming out and I'm filling up the shoe racks and you know, and I get the top row done and started to fill up the bottom row. Anyway, so um and I just kind of took a break and went and watched a movie. I did something. But I came back upstairs, had to do something, uh to, to folding laundry or whatever. And I walk back into the walk-in closet, and two pairs of shoes fell down. And I look, and I was like, well, what is that all about? Now, I posted pictures. I shot a lot of video. I haven't posted the video yet. And, and, and the shock that I had, when I walked in and saw those shoes on the floor, I, I didn't know what was it. So I put the shoes back up. I'm wondering what's going on. I split and uh, finished what I was doing, and I and I walked back in. This is a uh, this is about an hour later, and I remember I, I walked you know into the bedroom, and I made the left hand turn into uh, the bathroom where the walk-in closet is, and I stopped and I went, "Man, those shoes better not have fallen down." And I just kind of panicked, <laughs> and I walked around, kind of look, and they they fell down again. And they're like in the middle of the floor, too. It's not like they just fell. And and I stopped. I took some pictures. I shot a video. I posted those pictures online. Put the shoes back up. I went, I got a ghost. I got a ghost. And I put the shoes back up. And now I'm thinking I got I to gotta, I, I gotta run some video. I, I've got to capture this. And uh, this was Saturday or Friday night. And I'm in bed. It's Friday night. And I'm watching a movie, and right as there's like this quiet spot, I hear this boom, boom. I went, oh my God, you've got to be kidding me. I go back up, I go in, the shoes fell down again by themselves. And now I'm sh at two o'clock in the morning, I'm shooting video, I'm taking pictures, I put the shoes back up, um, I go to bed, I wake up in the morning, it's eight o'clock, and, and now I'm back on the shoe thing, and I walk back in, they fell down again. So that was like four times, maybe five times in about 12 hours. And I'm kind of panicking. Um, and I had all kinds of plans to set up cameras, and I'm still going to do it. So anyway, I moved the shoes to the second level. 
I came back upstairs about an hour later, walked in, and they fell off the second, the, the lower rack. But they didn't fall down. They were just out and perfectly lined up. I got pictures. I went, okay, it's the shoes. The shoes, I don't have a ghost. I had convinced myself of that. So I left the shoes where they were on the second level. None of the other shoes, and there's 20, 30 pairs of shoes. Nothing else is moving. It's just these two pair. All right. So then I'm in the garage. I'm unpacking boxes, and I'm moving stuff back into the house. I find some more shoes. And uh, I said, okay, all right. So I put these aside. I took those upstairs, and I put those on the shoe rack and uh, where the other two shoes were. And I split. This is now yesterday afternoon. And I, I walked back in yesterday afternoon, about an hour later, two hours later. I'm, I'm doing stuff around the house. Walked in. Those shoes fell down. <laughs> like, man, and I I don't know what's every, all the rest of the shoes. And they're all, um, look, I, I, I collect Adidas. I like Adidas. They're all Adidas. They've all got the same soles. They're made out of the same rubber. I don't know. None of the other shoes are moving. And it's just these down in the end, and and I can't I can't figure it out. So I'm I'm convinced it's the shoes. It's not a ghost. But I've got plenty of video cameras. I've got plenty. I've got a GoPro. I've got two Sony's. I've got plenty of uh, stands. I've got all kinds of memory cards. I've got extra batteries. I'm going to set up some video cameras. I'm going to set them up in there, and and film this. I just want to see them fall. That's it. I don't know if they're getting up and doing a dance of some ghost is putting them on and walking around and then taking them off. I, I don't know. Or are they just merely, you know, I, I'm going to capture this on film. I've shot four videos. I've got about 30 pictures that I have taken. I haven't caught it, but it's been going on. I'm convinced it's just the shoes. It's not that big of a deal. But I'm going to catch this crap on video. I'm going to watch this myself. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. It is Halloween week. That's my Halloween story. That's how I'm kicking off the week. I've got a ghost in my house. I got a ghost. I got a ghost. There is a ghost in Cassidy Church. Our host, Jimmy Church tonight. Craig Campobasso is here to discuss his new book, The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. You can get your own copy, get it autographed. The links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. We're also going to talk about the movie Dune, the old and the new. I'm your host, Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network and KJCR and the UnX Network. Race Hobbs. I'll be right back after this short break with tonight's guest, Craig Campobasso. Stay right there. This is Nicole Church, daughter of you-know-who, and you're listening to Fade to Black on JimmyChurchRadio.com and the Game Changer Network. You're listening to Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Fade to Black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. Introducing the Game Changer Blend from River Moon Coffee that delivers a customized blend made specifically for the Fader Knots. If the game is rigged, change the game. It's a bolder cup with some bite. Game Changer is the coffee of choice for those that prefer an organic dark roast that is slightly lighter and milder, but it's still dark. With wild notes of pecans and chocolate with a rich, balanced, full-bodied cup that is roasted to perfection for a great coffee to start your day as an after-dinner coffee or anywhere in between. Artisan small batch roasted to perfection. USDA certified organic all River Moon coffee is freshly roasted and packaged in the USA. Just go to rivermooncoffee.com or click on the banners over on our site and use the promo code F2B Blend for 15% off of your order today. Rivermooncoffee.com. This is the only way forward. This is Made to Black. Make contact. 
This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can get our podcast for just $2 per month. All you have to do is click on the podcast banner over at jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, folks. It's trembling times and fear is pushing emotions, which in turn pushes health the wrong direction. Do you ever get an ache because life is uneasy? Try Life Change Tea at getthetea.com. Life Change Tea works on your digestive tract, helping to move food through quicker and comfortably so your health is spot on. Life Change Tea may not help with world issues, but it will help with your digestive issues. A glass a day helps keep the intruders away. So, change your life today. Log on to getthetea.com. That's getthetea.com. If your health game is off, get on by ordering Life Change Tea. Getthetea.com. And while you're on our site, look around at the great non-GMO organic supplements. And if you're a sales shopper, go to our specials page and see what's for you. I've been drinking the tea for 12 years, and I'm sure glad for its health benefits. Again, that's getthetea.com. Getthetea.com. The tea that makes you go. Hello, Fader Knots. Ray Sobs here, inviting all of you to join us for the launch of a brand new broadcasting platform called the UnX Network. Tune in Halloween night as we go live on the X Streams for the first time to reveal our plans for this brand new and exciting platform. If you have an interest in the paranormal, UFOs, cryptids, Ghosts, hidden histories, and alternative research. Breakthrough technology. You will want to make the X your brand new home. Our programs will feature many familiar faces and even more new ones. And our listeners can interact and help investigative journalists, authors, researchers, and hosts who work diligently in the fight against the ideological divide that exists in media today. This platform is for critical thinkers seeking the alternatives to mainstream thought. So join us October the 31st at 8 p.m. Eastern at unxnetwork.com as we kick off the mothership, the Unex Network, explaining the unexplained. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show on the Game Changer Radio Network. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Matthews, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back. Fade to Black, I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Craig Campobasso is with us discussing his new book. I've got it right here. There it is. You know what, though? Everybody else is getting autographed copies. I, I don't know. Hold on, hold on. Let me double check. No, no, mine's not autographed. A little upset about this. Got to make this, got to make this happen. Craig Campobasso is with us. Multiple award-winning filmmaker, Emmy-nominated casting director. He was 15 when he started in the entertainment business. His young acting career was off to a great start. He landed his first national commercial for McDonald's chicken sandwiches. That's right. And spoke his first line of dialogue to Tuesday Weld. After graduating high school at the age of 17, he went back to work uh, behind the scenes on such blockbuster classics as Frank Herbert's Dune, directed by David Lynch. I talked about that earlier. Conan the Destroyer and Total Recall. He began his casting career on Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories. I've watched all of those, by the way. He received an Emmy a nomination for Outstanding Casting for a series on David E. Kelly's Picket Fences. Craig's casting career spans three decades, and uh, he directed, wrote, and produced Stranger at the Pentagon. We talked about that a few years ago when it was released, which was adapted from a popular UFO book uh, authored by uh, Dr. Uh, Frankie Stranges. After production, the short film collected accolades in September 2014. It won Best Sci-Fi Film at the Bur- Burbank International Film Festival, selling out all 275 seats. In 2015, it won a Remy Award for at the World Fest Houston International Film Festival for Best Sci-Fi Short. He has appeared on many radio shows, including Coast to Coast AM, and uh, he's been a guest on Open Minds, 
uh, with Regina Meredith, Beyond Belief with George Nori, and he's also appeared on Ancient Aliens. I would like to welcome back to Fade to Black, the one and only Craig Campobasso. Craig, good evening, my man. How you doing? Hey, how are you, Jimmy? It's so good to be here. It's so good to have you. It's so good to have you back. And this is, you know, uh, before I ask uh, the the opening question, which is, you know, what have you been up to? I want the audience to know it's been a while since Craig has been on the show, but we're always in touch and we're always talking. And he's working with with all of my friends here in the community. And it's just one of those things. Where I was like, Craig, we got to get you back on the show, and and here you are tonight. But what have you been up to? <laughs> well, first off, um, I had the publisher send you your book, so when I see you, I will sign it for you. Yeah, right on. So right I, on. I dig signing books. I think it's really cool. Yeah, we've got um, uh, we've got your link up to get an autographed copy of the book, and uh, you can head over it. to JimmyChurchRadio.com and and click on the link. But, oh, uh, awesome. Oh, man, I've been up to a whole lot of stuff. We're um, uh, now taking the book and creating a documentary. So we've been working on that for about six months. Uh, We've already interviewed probably 15, 20 people, um, you know, UFO professionals. So we're looking at the documentary as an extension of the book where we can now get into um, hearing from the real live contactees whose information um, they allowed me to use in the book and what happened in those contacts, et cetera. So uh, that uh, interviewing uh, hybrids who say that they have either one, two, or three different kinds of uh, alien DNA in their system, uh, and, and they talk about how that happened, and a lot of them are, you know, totally different. So, so what we're going to do in the documentary, besides hearing from all the professionals, is bring all the extraterrestrials to life through CGI. Now, so, uh, you also uh, have been working with uh, Daralanka. And yes. uh, now, yeah. listen, listen, I, 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 uh, I uh, well, I called you, but I also called Daryl straight away. And and I said, look, this new film is fantastic. It's the casting in this film that is unbelievably great. And and I said, how did Craig pull that off? This is my private conversation with Daryl, you know, away right. from you. And and his his reaction to that uh, privately to me, I hope I'm not giving away too much from Daryl, is that too too many films get made today without the recognition of who is doing the casting. It 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 is you know people enjoy the they don't understand one of the most important components is the casting director and how that gets done. Um, so hats off to you. I mean, it, it was just a mind blowing experience and, and to hear Daryl go, Jimmy, thank you for recognizing that. It was, it was, yeah. you know, and, he and was the fifth you. beetle. Yeah. Thank you for recognizing that because we are the unsung heroes. We're finally, we were finally recognized, oh, maybe 10 years ago by the television Academy to receive, well, more than 10 years ago. Uh, maybe because uh, I think Picket Fences was in the mid '90s, so it was a little before then. But the like the Motion Picture Academy is still really not recognizing casting directors for their work. They'll give they'll give an Academy Award to somebody who does hair, but not the person who helps to get those actors in there. And a lot of people don't realize. You know, really what our job is creatively is finding the right people for the money that they have and and finding the right people who have the vibe that goes along with that and then uh, working to achieve it. But we also have to do their deals. We have to get creative with all different kinds of things. So, um, I mean, I love working with Daryl. Uh, I started working with him on uh, his uh, other film, First Contact. And uh, so, anyway, Daryl's in uh, the E.T. Omanac documentary as well. Hey, he has to be. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, he's amazing. He, he's he's his amazing. own he's his own species. Yeah. So, um, uh, I I don't I don't want. To, let me talk about alienated for for just a second because sure. this involves you as well. Well, the movie does, but I'm talking about the subject matter. Um, but with alienated, when you look at the cast. Um, with a, with an independent film, one of the things that I think we were always used to is going, you know what they got, you know, it's the camera, it's the, it's somebody's brother is, is coming in. They need, need somebody for this role, somebody's cousin, somebody's friend, you know, and you're just filling the slot so you can make the film. And I get that. And we're all used to that. This film, everybody is acting in this film i mean it is there isn't a role in the film that isn't uh uh not only acted but done with it with emotion and done correctly and that's all great but uh, gracie lacy oh my god right I, lo- I love her i swear the minute she walked through the door i was like this is the girl this is it and I remember when I brought her in for Daryl and Erica, the minute she walked out the door, Daryl looked at me and he goes, Shep, she's it. That's her. She, you know, I, amazing. She uh, um, she was an alien. And yeah. the, the thing is, this is the deal. Alien love story. Okay, all right. I, I'm really going to have to be sold on this. Right, right. right. <laughs> I'm really going to. And and she did just that. Yeah I, I, yeah. I could absolutely see this happening. And and she she was in that role. She was in the role. She was, man. She she's great. I I really see her going places. I mean, she's just as cute as a button. She can act. She can she can do it all. She's unique. You know, she's unique. And that's what I was talking about earlier. It's like she has that little extra substance that was just right for the part. Yeah, and she wore that hat like a pro. Yeah, she did. I that, want that hat. I hope Daryl has that hat. I asked her. I, I, I said, she better have taken it. She better have stolen it uh, from wardrobe. <laughs> Because uh, when she walked in that that scene, I think it was in uh, in the restaurant, right? Um, right. But when she walked in wearing that hat, it was uh, it was pretty cool. So anyway, it this this good. this subject of aliens and ET and UFOs and contact and abductees and contactees, um, it's a fun subject. I talk about it every night on the show. It's it's certainly part of pop culture now. It is it has yeah. grabbed this planet. What got you into this? Did you did you have a, a a childhood of of alien abduction? Did you have a crazy aunt or uncle? I mean, what got you into this? You know, it's it's really interesting. When I was uh, when I was young and growing up, I had experiences um, where I would wake up in the middle of the night and I would see an angel, right? And the first time it happened, I thought it was the spirit of either my mother, father, or my two sisters. And I frantically ran in, and I remember holding my hand like this over under their nostrils to see if they were b- breathing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another time when I was around 10, I was uh, taking a bath, and all of a sudden I looked into the nozzle, And it was like somebody took my entire soul essence, pulled it out, drug it into the middle of the universe. The universe opened up. I felt what it was like on the uh, on the inside spirit plane. And all of a sudden, all of the questions are, uh, who am I? Where did I come from? All of those things ran through my 10 year old head. I was sucked back into my body. And I just stared in that nozzle for a while. And then I never I, I never spoke about these experiences with my parents. It was like they were a race, but from time to time I would recall them. And then after I finished working on Amazing Stories, I was 26 years old and I started having uh, dream states with master teachers. And they were universal master teachers. 
And I was put through a, a two-year sort of waking progress of going from being totally asleep to being as awake as I can. And part of that process was for me to start writing books like this mm -hmm. and, my, and my other book set, which is the autobiography of an extraterrestrial saga. Um, it's a four part book series. Uh, I'm working on uh, book five now. There'll be seven in total. So basically those books are just chock full of universal information and all kinds of stuff. So they, when they give me images, I either hear it, see it, or I actually will astral travel there and actually experience it in the environment. Take so me, is, well, uh, we've been talking about this a lot lately. Take me yeah. through, uh, I doubt that any of it is typical, but uh, take me through uh, uh, one of these experiences and how it goes down. So, for instance, um, you're, you're asleep, and then all of a sudden your soul is somewhere else, and you... When you wake up in the next, and when you wake up in that environment, it's a whole different experience than a dream. It's like, you know, that it's like what I call a lucid dream because you actually wake up and you were actually there. Actually, one of the master teachers said to me that the universe doesn't differentiate between um, experience just in the physical. It happens in the mental and the spiritual, and that I was having these experiences uh, with them in the spiritual realm, right? So this waking process started there, and then they, uh, at one point, they started feeding me a golden light, which ballooned in my body, and it was like all the cells in my body started waking up, and it was like, all of a sudden, they, the cells became sort of like time, time. Remember contact with all the little pills, the little uh, beads inside? Yes. It was like a time release for me to start waking up to all of the things and the wonders and the universe. And so this was a two-year period. And that's when I actually started writing the autobiography of an extraterrestrial uh, saga books was then. And uh, so it's it's like being there. And then I started having the experience where when I was in my when I was walking around daily, I was actually astral traveling at the same time and having sort of like this binary experience as well. Well, you know, it, it, um, it, 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 it sounds unique, except I yeah. would I would think that that is everybody that shops at Gelson's on Ventura Boulevard. <laughs> it's the San Fernando <laughs> Valley, man. <laughs> I just had to you say know, it. I, I just had to say it. I, that's so funny. That's I, so funny. I had to say it. I had to say it. And not just any Gelson's, the one next to Ralph's that's, on, on that's, Havenhurst. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, man. But um, now, what about... Um, have you had sightings and 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 things as well to go along with this? I well, when I was going through this waking period, I this is when I became really engrossed in wondering about life elsewhere. So I started uh, reading lots of spiritual books. I lived at the Bodhi Tree. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I went through their UFO section. Um, like lickety split if there was a contactee or somebody that was there or a representative of a contactee from around the world speaking at the Bodhi tree, I would go there. I would go into private homes where there were giving talks. And then I actually started throwing UFO parties where I would have a ufologist come to my house. And it, back in the days of VHS and, and you know, they pop in VHS. And back then I had like a, a one bedroom apartment and I would uh, literally there was a hundred people packed in 
my one bedroom apartment because everybody wanted to learn about it so much. So, so those were really fun. I used to make giant vats of spaghetti and, you know, there we'd have spaghetti UFO parties. So, um, but I got very interested in it then. And, um, and I just continued my journey. I just started studying my, my favorite thing was all of the, the very early contactees because they were all human. They were human beings from around the universe that lived in various, on, in, on the inside of various planets, right? Right. And as it was explained to me, is that they don't live on the outside of planets because of the, um, you know, the conditions in the universe and the sun and all of that. How they stay young is they go into confined environments where they where they have resonation fields that actually keep their cells young and youthful. So that's why they all look like they're 30 to 38 years old. And if you go back to the two of the early contactees is that um, Saul Gonda, who was a Venusian, visited George Van Tassel and gave him the blueprints to build the Integratron, which was a cell rejuvenation chamber, right? Right. And, uh, and also, um, uh, who was uh, Adamski? They yes. also, you know, as well. So, so a lot of the early contactees, they were bringing forth that information also for us. And, um, you know, so... It was really amazing. Now, um, let's talk about that for a second, because when you listen to, and I'm, I'm so thankful that a lot of uh, George Adamski's early presentations that he did around Southern California have all been preserved, and, and you can go and listen to these uh, talks that he gave, and his television interviews and things, and, and they're all there. Um, right. But one of the things that George uh, talked about, not only the Integratron, but it was the the mathematical formulas they gave him to record time, and and he built a time machine in, in Santa Monica, California, and he's been very forward about all of this information. And George also uh, described the interior of the craft the first time that he took his ride in it out there at, at Giant Rock. And his description of the interior of this and the control panels and the displays and how it looked, it did not fit the pattern, Craig, of of what we knew about technology in 1950. It just it, it didn't. Right. And it, it the right. what what George talked about seemed to me to be information that was genuine. It wasn't it wasn't a terrestrial. Uh, thing that he was trying to relate to everybody. It seemed like right. it came from somewhere else. It did, yeah. And he described the interior of the craft. There was uh, Solgonda uh, was about five six, blonde, short hair, and uh, uh, a slim form. The other gentlemen that were on the ship were very similar to him. And that the interior walls were kind of like a mother of pearl kind of uh, look, which I've never heard in any of the descriptions of uh, any of the contactees. And that I, I believe the control uh, panel where they did it was sort of like geometrical shapes and different things like that, which he had never seen. Now, what fascinated George about this was is he was a pilot and, you know, he worked for Howard Hughes. He, uh, you know, he, he came up with that. So it was really fascinating for him to see it. And his son-in-law, Daniel Boone, I also interviewed um, when he was alive uh, in, in, in his old age. And he said that he witnessed it from where he lived, which was right behind the Integratron, right? Yes. So, um, because originally that was George's house, right? And yes. then when George moved out, when he passed and moved out of that house, then Daniel Boone and his son Matthew 
moved into that house. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, and to this day, that whole area out there, um, Joshua Tree, uh, is just awash with sightings. I have seen the craziest yeah. stuff. Some of the craziest sightings I've ever had were right there. I think they they continue uh, to this day. Uh, George, yes. yeah, George got lucky. He got lucky with Giant Rock. You know, yeah. he, he liked the rock. Right? <laughs> he, yeah. he wanted to build his <laughs> runway. He wanted to have his little airport. Um, he wanted his wife's apple pies to be famous. And and Howard Hughes is flying out there to hang out with him, uh, you know, flying out from Santa Monica. And all of this is 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 fact. You know, it's, it's part of history. Right. Um, and then one day, George... Felt compelled uh, to walk outside, and there was this craft right there next to Giant Rock, and and everything started after that. It's such an an incredible, incredible story. Let's take our break right here. This is Fade to Block. Our guest tonight, Craig Campabasso. We are talking about his new book. It's right here, The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. You can get your own copy. The links are over at jimmychurchradio.com. and get your autograph copy there as well. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. And as of October 31st, the UnX Network. This Thursday, Ray's Hobbs will be joining us to announce the UnX Network. Stay with us. We'll be right back. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one year anniversary. That's right, one year. And as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30 day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Because you never got that pony you always wanted. <laughs> Damn it. Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network. Listen, I know and you know that you've always wanted your first crystal skull. Or maybe you're a collector just like me, but you just don't know where to go to find the real thing. Then I met Carolyn Ford over at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. Carolyn is the guardian of Einstein, one of the most respected ancient crystal skulls in the world. All of her unique skulls have been imprinted sitting with Einstein in his sacred lodge and are carved from the finest gemstone and materials. Imprinting is the process of receiving the ancient wisdom from the master skull or master computer. Einstein, the ancient crystal skull. To see Carolyn's current collection of crystal skulls, just visit her store at EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com or click on the banner over on our site. Don't forget to use the promo code JIMMY at checkout to receive 10% off of your order today. That's promo code JIMMY. Finding your first or next crystal skull is easy. Just visit EinsteinTheCrystalSkull.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of fade to black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the fade to black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of fade to black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied, dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. 
Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. Hello, I'm Katie and you're listening to my very man, Jimmy Church, on jimmychurchradio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet, and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. We're the Honey Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you can become an official fade or not by just going to our membership section at jimmychurchradio.com. Hello, this is Serena Wright Taylor from Conscious Life Expo, and you're listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church, who holds the Lucky Pony record for the best astrological chart since 1963. True story. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Craig Campobasso is with us discussing his new book, The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. We're going to get into the book right now. What a great week. It's Halloween week here on Fade to Black. And uh, not that <laughs> not that uh, this book has anything to do with Halloween. <laughs> but but well, then it does. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> But, I was gonna say we could. Everyone can go as Snake Girl on the cover, <laughs> right there, right there, right there, Snake Girl. Now, um, it, it, but this is what is interesting. Um, uh, the subtitle of the book, you know, a guide to uh, grays, reptilians, uh, hybrids, and Nordics. But it's it's not that simple, is it? Everything no. is broken down. Um, yes. Each species or race, however you want to define it, um, multiple, multiple reports and and testimony out there of these species. I want to jump into the grays uh, first. Um, certainly, well, because of Whitley Streeper, probably um, one of the most identifiable uh, species and and faces out there um, is the grays, but. The grades can be broken down into how many subgroups? Oh, my God. uh, Thousands. Literally thousands. I mean, there there literally was a time um, where a woman who was a psychic, we were in a room, and all of a sudden she started describing the uh, two of the master teachers that first came to me and then the whole room filled up she said with thousands of different looking type gray looking beings right so so again in describing all races including humans and grays and reptilians and nordics is that we have to remember to judge the individual and not the race Right. Because there is always going to be a negative factor within uh, with every within every race. So anyway, so there are so many different types of grays. You know, we have the the um, Sasani, which are Daryl Anka, which are uh, 500 years in the future, which are. Um, which Bashar is actually Daryl's future self who is teaching him and channeling through him here on Earth, right? So these are all very advanced beings and there are, I believe, seven different hybrids of them and each one is the next step in evolution and I think the last one is uh, coming up soon. So 
And then we have the greys that abduct. Most abduction scenarios, uh, people have described horrific things. And then as they got further down in many years, they, they believed that it was... Uh, it was a uh, more of a meant to be thing that they were supposed to uh, give up their genetic materials and things like that. What we really don't know is that is uh, is that grays, especially with with their large eyes, we know that they can do what we call sort of like. Um, uh, telepathic hypnosis on someone, right? We we know this because it's been talked about in several things, even in Travis Walton's, right? And I was just talking to Jen Stein about this, is that they tried when he woke up on the ship and and he saw them and he stumbled and pushed them away. They focused their eyes on him to take control of his mind and he wouldn't lit them, so they left the room, right? So, so this telepathic hypnosis is to keep people sort of under their control for what they're doing. So do we really know the agendas of everyone? I think each ab abductee will have their own story to it. And those are those are the ones that every you know everyone is telling. I've heard some people had horrific stories. I mean, Calvin Parker, for instance, the 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 uh, evil extraterrestrial woman did horrendous things to him. Some so horrendous he will not talk about them to this day. Now right? uh, we have um, a couple of uh, well, many, but. Uh, a, a couple of references that depict the grays as one of two things. Right. Um, biological, this is right. who they are, or the other right. one, which th th they may be uh, more robotic or genetically engineered, and they are yeah. just taskmasters. They're, they're right. sent out, they're, they're the ones doing the abductions, and there isn't an emotional component to them. That they That's are right. more robotic, right? That's right. And and if you're if you were a very smart race, right, and um, you wanted to go in and get genetic materials and that kind of stuff, you would not want to be in harm's way doing it yourself. So if you were smart enough to create biological entities and send them to do your own to do your work, that's why some people, when they see them, they feel that they are soulless, right? And then other other grays aren't. And and from what what I understood in interviewing a lot of people for the book is that the good grays prefer not to be called grays they preferred to be called like because they're from zeta reticuli they prefer to be called zeta humans now uh and the, and, and continuing this uh there yeah. are tall grays and short grays as well that's right that's right that's right tall grays short grays um and and the thing that i think is most interesting is uh i believe that most of them uh, have the giant human eyes underneath. And that, as we know, that some of the races have, they put a lens in, they sew a lens in because of the light, it does affect them. So that's why it looks like their eyes are black, right? Right. So, so uh, they have very, very large eyes. And... Um, but I don't know if that's true for all of the different races that do look like grays. There are some that are that are uh, uh, more sinister, um, more aggressive um, in some abduction scenarios, and then there's others that are benevolent. Well, and, so, and, and we've heard both sides of that too, as well. Right um, now, right. through your interviews. Um, does it seem that the Greys are doing most of the abductions? 
We don't hear about, you know, mantis beings or, or you know, other. Is, is it uh, through your interviews, have you found that it's the greys that are that are abducting? Well, there are some, yeah, there are some where greys are abducting, but we don't know if they're benevolent or whatever, because if you woke up on a table and you have never seen one before, you would be terrified and they would put you back to sleep, right? Sure. But sometimes there is a mantis that is actually seen in the background like they're observing. Right. Right. So so we're we're not sure if then it, because I've only heard of benevolent experiences with Mantis. And I did interview a Mantis hybrid, which was really interesting, who actually did the language for us, um, which uh, uh, I learned a whole lot because. All of the people that I have met throughout the years, nobody really had a handle on the mantis beings. Now all of a sudden there are we're we're getting hybrids and people coming forward who actually have a lot more information and about who they are and and uh and how they act. They say even though it looks like they are emotionless, they do have emotions on the inside. We're just not they're not able to express it the way we do they would express it more telepathically. Did right? you did you say um, a minute ago, did you say that you can deny access? No. Okay. All right. What, what, deny access to what? Uh, to, to an abduction. Well, if you didn't, if you, do, if you're being abducted and you don't want it to happen, then you can as a, as a sovereign being, claim your sovereignty and say that you do not want this to happen. How do you do that? Bruce Lee? Ha. Wow. Yeah. Well, I've, I've come across a lot of things, even with uh, children um, that are, that are little that they start getting the myth from the second they can point and talk, they're seeing and, and things. Uh, sometimes they're seeing uh, bad entities Sometimes they're seeing uh, enlightened beings. Um, and so when I work with them, I just, you know, I say, look, you, you have to claim it. You as the mother, because you or the father, you have to claim it because this is your space. Mm -hmm. And you have to say that you cannot do this to my child. Right. Right. And, and that you, uh, so you claim your sovereignty. I always say, call in the whole angelic core, of course, bring in Michael, cause he's the big guy. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, and I find that it does, uh, it will calm down for a lot of people the, if they don't want to experience it. Right. So, um, because sometimes it is terrifying uh, to people. I mean, because I've been so open about it my whole life. Um, I talk to actors. Um, I know what actors have seen extraterrestrials. I, uh, some have seen the craft landing on their front yard um, or on their ranches where they had cattle mutilations. Um, so it's, you know, um, I mean, one one actor even fought one in a bedroom. She told me when it was trying to take her daughter. Now, um, uh, in, in through your interviews, um, yeah. have is there an example of like negativity when we say malevolent or benevolent? That that's one thing, but has has the, has a gray caused harm? Now, I know a gray looks scary, right? Scary right, AF, right. okay? Yeah, I right, get that. Right. You're terrified. But has has there been an act of violence from a gray? I don't... I have never heard of an act of violence, but I have seen some abductions gone very wrong. Uh, there was a gentleman that came to my house in the 90s, and he was abducted. 
And he showed me, he lifted up both eyelids and they had implanted a thing around the back of his eyeballs that went from here Mm -hmm. all the way around. And he said, and he was so freaked out because he said, they're seeing everything I see now. I'm like their camera because they put this camera thing in me and he he would have to go and have it surgically removed. I mean, can you imagine having your eyeballs popped out to have this thing taken out? And we, and we don't even know if they could do that. So that was really kind of terrifying for me um, to see that. There was another time where there were metal prongs coming out of the roof of someone's mouth, which was a bad implant or whatever they put in, you know. Um, that was kind of uh, scary. Um, I think the experience alone is scary for a lot of people, but since I've been doing the book, I've been getting a lot more people coming forward with different races that, uh, that they've seen, that they were in contact with, um, some on, you know, some uh, in the dream state, some, some astrally, right? And uh, so, so again, I think it kind of boils down to the individual. Um, and, and as we know that the whole genetic program that's going on is uh, from what, uh, there's several different things. So if a race decides to come to earth, right? Like we know the tall grays have been here for a long time. We know that um, I think in one of Dr. Greer's uh, documentaries that uh, that the government has been uh, that ET presence on Earth has uh, known back at least ten thousand years, and we know that from hieroglyphics and from especially down in Mexico, where all of the Greys and their ships are. Uh, drawn into rocks. Right, right. So, um, well, um, but uh, uh, staying with uh, this the, this gray um, abduction part, um, that there seems to be, and I just want to know what uh, what you've gathered through your interviews, that there is a general lack of empathy. Right, yes. Th that there there isn't a, an emotional friendship bond being established at that moment, but that the Greys also try to calm you down if they right. if they detect that you're terrified or freaking out, they will take measures to calm you down. I don't know if that's empathetic or they're just trying to get the operation done, right? <laughs> Whatever. Well, they're just trying to get the operation done. And, um, you know, I, I think that they're here to do a job and it's really taking genetic materials and it's creating uh, new races. We've all heard the, you know, the one reason for, certain grays was because their race was dying out and they needed genetic materials because they had cloned themselves too many times. They lost pretty much their soul. They couldn't ascend anymore. So they had to go back into the human matrix and, and take our DNA. So were they, are, are they taking it unwillingly or not, and then we hear the thing that goes back to Eisenhower, where there was a treaty signed, and and that they were allowed to abduct certain street people or people that were not pillars of society to do tests on, but then they found out that they were abducting lots of people. And that um, I even heard one story that they they got one of the crash one of their crash ships, and not only did they find a bunch of uh, animal parts, but they found a bunch of human parts as well. Now, um, which which takes us to this: um, is it 
uh, when we talk about, you know, cattle mutilations is one thing. It's taking it to another level of, of human right. mutilations. Um, is it is it the greys doing this or is it the greys getting the victims, the abductees, onto the ship? And then it's another race of beings that are conducting the experiments. Well, how how I have heard it is that it is the greys doing the first part and then the really brilliant reptilian stepping in and doing the rest. Now, um, it, when the, when we talk about the size of the Milky Way, and you know, right. billion, hundreds of billions of planets uh, that are Earth-like not not five, not ten, not a dozen, but forty, fifty, or a hundred billion planets. Certainly, that would indicate multiple races of Greys, not just That's from right. one particular star system. There must be right. tens of thousands of them. Tens of thousands, and of humans as well. I, I'm sure of everything that we've seen and, and a lot of different things that we haven't seen. You know, Allagash was ant-looking type creatures. You know, when you get into hybridization, that when you have these tech gods that know how to do it, they have mastered it, they can take any DNA from animals and humans and mix them all up and create a whole different species. And they can program that species for to do their bidding if they are, you know, if they're nefarious and are looking to sort of take over certain things. Or did those ant beings get that way through genetics? Or was there a planet where they sort of came up on? Um, I was. Uh, I wanted to share some statistics because uh, the Alpha Centaurians say that they know of one million nineteen thousand races. Right. Um, the Urantia book says that there are. Five trillion three hundred and forty two billion four hundred and eighty two million three hundred and thirty seven thousand and six hundred and sixty six worlds. Makes sense. Yeah. It might even so, be a low number. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, a low number, exactly. And of course those are growing, you know, those keep going because the universe keeps expanding and things become multidimensional and then that's just one fragment. You know, we're in we're in this universe and then there are many other ovum universes within a super universe and that there are seven super universes. And in each one, there are supposedly 700,000 local universes like we're in a local universe, which is ginormous. Now, right? um, before we head to the break, uh, yeah. uh, we're going to cover so much more tonight. And I want to wrap up on the grays really quick. Um, how, what are the earliest reports of, of Gray's visiting earth? Um, I, I don't think it started with, uh, Betty and Barney Hill. Alistair Crowley, uh, has his famous, you know, contact and illustration, which right. that looks as, as much of a gray as any reports that I have ever seen. What are the earliest reports? How long have the grays been here? Well, the earliest reports, they, they do go back to ancient Egypt, and they go back to uh, the Aztecs. Uh, and we know that through, like I said, hieroglyphics and through the, uh, everything that they recorded on the rocks and, some, and sometimes in their temples. They would actually draw the actual spaceships, and there were lots of different... Uh, they would draw the greys as well. So... I, it, it makes us think we're the gray, we're the good grays coming at that time and helping them with technology for an upgrade, right? And or were they taking DNA back then as well? I, I mean, we we have no idea. Um, now and, and remember, Betty and Barney Hill that really kind of wasn't a gray because it was more gecko-like, right? The eyes. So it wasn't what we would consider a gray, and Betty was very fond of Junior, the examiner, 
Um, and when she was regressed, she, you know, she really was just talking to him normal about, you know, well, where are you from? And blah, 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 where Barney was terrified. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, um, you know, it's fascinating that they were just fascinated and wanted to, uh, just examine her and Barney and just see where we were evolution wise. Well, the sculpture that uh, Betty made, we got to take a break here in just a second, yeah. but the sculpture that she made, um, and she took around with her for many years, yes. um, that sculpture looks like the cover of Communion, and it looks very much like what uh, Aleister Crowley had had drawn, uh, had drawn, you know, probably three, four decades before the uh, Hill encounter. And but it it's the eyes that's not the the eyes aren't gray they're they're slit mm -hmm. but they're more gecko like mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i had this conversation with uh kathleen martin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so so they weren't the typical gray eyes right? now um uh, one one last question yeah. are grays typically naked or or do they have uniforms they have uniforms, but all uniforms are very form-fitting. They're like a second layer of skin. And and what about sex? Do, are are they asexual? Well, some uh, some have uh, cups, right? So a male would have uh, because they're really kind of like asexual. Right. So like what we might consider a male would have spokes. And the female would have the opposite spokes, so it's sort of like putting the cups together. Other races, actually, other races, they all have a vagina, and within the vagina, they have a penis. Say what? So, wait, wait, whoa, yes. whoa, whoa, whoa. So, and within the vagina, they have a penis, right. and they can either play both parts. At the same time, you know, uh, going, uh, I'm trying to find the right word. Pe uh, pitching and catching. Yes, pitching and catching. Exactly. Thank you. And uh, so, and and maybe alone, too. Or as they well. can pitch. They right. can pitch uh, at the same time, too. <laughs> so I wonder how they would identify themselves. Would they be they, them, or both? I know, right? Right. This, yeah. Uh, it's, fasc it's fascinating. It's really fascinating. You're going to leave that right there. This is Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, our guest, Craig Campabasso. We're talking about his new book. I have it here, The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. Get your own. The links are at jimmychurchradio.com. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. <laughs> Hello, Fader Knots. Ray Sobs here, inviting all of you to join us for the launch of a brand new broadcasting platform called the UnX Network. Tune in Halloween night as we go live on the X Streams for the first time to reveal our plans for this brand new and exciting platform. If you have an interest in the paranormal, UFOs, cryptids, ghosts, hidden histories, and alternative research, breakthrough technology, you will want to make the X your brand new new home. Our programs will feature many familiar faces and even more new ones. And our listeners can interact and help investigative journalists, authors, researchers, and hosts who work diligently in the fight against the ideological divide that exists in media today. This platform is for critical thinkers seeking the alternatives to mainstream thought. So join us October the 31st at 8 p.m. Eastern at unxnetwork.com as we kick off off the mothership, the Unex Network, explaining the unexplained. 
fade or not. When you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. Fade or not. When you think about the future of our country and where we're headed, do you wonder about the food supply? I do. Disruptions in the food supply chain could be disastrous, and they usually occur with little warning. That's why the smartest thing you can do today is to stockpile emergency food, water, and other essentials. I personally recommend My Patriot Supply. They're the nation's largest emergency preparedness company, serving millions of customers for more than a decade. In fact, they're the only source my family trusts for our preparedness plan. You should too. Right now, save 20% off a full four-week supply of delicious meals that provide 2,000 calories a day. Saving 20% helps too, doesn't it? Especially now. So go to preparewithjimmy.com and get ready. That's preparewithjimmy.com. There's no time to lose. Do it now. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. You listen to us, and we listen to you. And so does the CIA. (laughs) You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is revolution. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Man, I need to uh, WD-40 my mic arm. Did you hear that? Our guest tonight, Craig Campobasso. More with Craig in just a minute. I wanted to mention something. Uh, I found a new series. It's not what you think. Well, if you're a fan of Rick and Morty, uh, like I am, there's a new series on Netflix. It's called Inside Job. Um, cartoon, adult animation, all the potty language that you can muster. Uh, every every bad word that you can think about is done in this, but it's for adults. Anyway, it's called Inside Job, and it's about an agency, a company, um, that is, uh, spoiler alert, is, is controlling the world. And it is absolutely wonderful. It is great. I'm binging it now. It's got a near-perfect review rating. It's 98% on Rotten Tomatoes. 98%. Um, and nearly perfect stars, perfect ratings uh, from from everybody out there. So I want you to check it out. It's called Inside Job, and I'm not going to give away any more than that. And we'll talk about uh, more about it on Fader Night this week. 
But uh, I'm a big fan of this kind of stuff. And everything that we talk about on Fade to Black is in this show. You've got to check it out. Um, uh, back to Craig. Craig, are you hip to Inside Job? <laughs> Have you been watching it? I haven't, but I'm going to watch it now. Everything. <laughs> it's it's so funny. Uh, there's uh, 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 all the all the uh, alien species are represented here, right? And and they're employees of this company. Um, but anyway, so uh, the the core group of uh, of 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 workers there. One of them uh, controls the media, and and she comes in and she goes, "Oh, great! Um, uh, I just had to." Uh, uh, she said, "Some I had to talk about food." So the networks are 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 talking about food to get off of this incident that just happened, and so every and they talk about crop circles, right? We had to. <laughs> they go. <laughs> the director of the company goes, we had budget cuts. Crop circles this year are just circles. <laughs> we, we couldn't afford anything else. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's just awesome. Uh, it's called Inside Job. And I am sure that the Fader Knots are popping up the links to it right now. And uh, go check it out on Netflix. Okay, next, everybody's favorite species reptilians yes oh 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 there's a whole episode of uh inside job dedicated to reptilians and and shape-shifting reptilians running the earth and uh it's it's pretty cool they reveal a couple of actors uh that are doing uh, anyway anyway <laughs> you've got to check out inside job Rep <laughs> reptilians now um uh, uh talking about malevolent and benevolent i want I actually want to head there first sure. um uh, reptilians freak me out yeah they do i i'm i'm freaked out about snakes and alligators and 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 everything reptilian that just exists around me, um, I would assume out of the gate that we are talking about a malevolent, evil, fork-tongued, bad situation. Is that the case or not? Well, from a lot of people that I have interviewed um, and some who claim to have reptilian DNA, right, Um Theirs are either positive or some are negative, right? What I find is that human star seeds who have come and incarnated on the planet that are here to help raise consciousness from the time their children are uh, plagued with reptilians um, getting into their mind and scaring them to knock them off their game so that they're not advancing at the rate that they're supposed to advance to help raise the consciousness. So, so right there that tells us that, that they're going in and they're trying to dumb down everything and keep it dumbed down because if they keep it dumbed down, then if it is true, and they have infiltrated this world and are running it from afar, then there it is, right? So that's scary in itself when you think about that. But then when you think about that there's really an angelic core, that there is that there are all of these incredibly benevolent created beings um, created beings are beings that have the same powers, um, divine powers that Christ had, because every all of all created beings are Christ, not in the sense of religion, but in the sense of the universe, right? So if you think of it, before Christ was a Christ, there were Christ in the universe. Yeah, the right? Christ consciousness. That, that Christ consciousness. So not to get confused with that. So when people call me and they're wigging out over that is, you know, I, I, I just tell them, you know, you, you have to look at it from the sense of, and you can stop those kind of um, uh, abductions or, or my, my, I call them some mind tricks because 
They're getting into your psyche, into your mind, and they're tricking it, right? And this is usually when people first really start to grow. And once they start to grow, I mean, I, I've been in touch with uh, um, some very advanced children, uh, two are brothers, and when I first met them, they were like 12 and 15. The 15-year-old already spoke five-star languages and was drawing star maps, and the other one uh, they would build things and say what they were going to build here on Earth, what they came here to Earth to build and to do to help the planet get back to the way that it was supposed to be. So when you see these amazing beings coming in, right, so strong, right, that's amazing. I mean, who taught? those kids, those languages. I mean, I can't, I, I don't know those languages, but. Um, I've seen so many videos and I've talked to a couple of them uh, directly. Yeah. And yeah. my mind is blown. I, I, yeah. I, I can't, I can't wrap my head around that. I've, I've, right. I've really tried to figure it out, Craig. I, and, and I simply can't. Um, with my conversations that I've had with different abductees, um, when when they describe uh, being in the presence of these uh, different uh, species, races, that it, it was always the reptilians that were the kind ones in the room. And, and I've, 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 that's kind of shocking to me because of the appearance and the description of reptilians are, to me, just plain and simply intimidating. But right. they've always been uh, described as uh, empathetic, kind, intelligent, um, uh, with, with very, uh, uh, forgiving eyes that look at you and you can feel their presence and there's a kindness there. I, it's, it's, it's in direct contrast to the reptilian image of what we're looking at. That's right. That's right. And, and when, when you have a reptilian, that is that, right. That is empathetic and all of that, just like in real life, if we were to see a kind, empathetic person, we would feel warmth and good from them. And that's what uh, people who have uh, had good reptilian experiences experience. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I even, uh, one of the stories was there was a, a guy, right, who, who was very connected to reptilians and that evidently his reptilian counterpart that he left behind before he came and incarnated here would come and they would actually um, have sex physically. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean, so there's like even stranger things that are out there that I've heard of different things of what people have. And some, some women, some women who are incubators for reptilian uh, hybrids, that they see a, a very, they, they feel in their dream state that they're having sex with a very handsome um, male. Mm -hmm. And right before climax, it's revealed that it's a reptilian. And just as in gray, uh, as in gray abductions, uh, they're told that they're special, right? And so whether or not the, their Samine tricks, when they say you're special, make them believe that they're special to continue doing that job, or did those people have a soul contract before they came in with that race, because they were previously a part of that race, to do this service to them. So, so these so, are things that we don't know. So they they shape shift from Matthew McConaughey to a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Rex, there you go. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes, exactly, exactly. The, these are the stories that that I myself have heard. Wow. So, wow. so, but I I just want to say two things about 
hybrids, right? I, I, we know that everyone thinks that this hybridization is is for taking over the world and those type of things. But there is another uh, scenario that I have heard that when a race wants to learn about another race and that they are advanced, right? That let's say if they came to earth and they set up shop underground, right? And, um, uh, and the only way for them to survive here and to learn about us is to become us. And that's why they may come here for a thousand or 10,000 years to learn about us. And so what they do is they start hybridization with us so that they can be more sustainable on earth and that they can learn about who we are from the inside out as well as humans with the uh, human DNA. So there was another, uh, you know, there's another um, hypothesis that's, you know, that's out there and or it, uh, is the hybridization program to get everyone up to speed and more evolved for when the time that Earth shifts over and that and because we're a hodgepodge of all different races anyway here that maybe in enlightenment will be all of these different races. I mean, there's so many scenarios that are out there. So right. um, all we can do is stay positive and, and try and help those who are going through it, through it. So, so if the shape shifting goes down with me, right. can, can I request Selma Hayek to come back? I mean, you can. <laughs> I can. I, 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 okay. Now, what about what about? I'm just saying. I'm just. I'm I, at I, that I, moment. I, at that moment, I need by, Selma to come back. By the way, when we talked about the reproductive things, you know, I just want you to know, and and your listeners, that that was bonus material. That's not in the book. <laughs> <laughs> now, what about, okay, so now, uh, then we have the, uh, I'm, I'm just going to say, it. then we have the David Icke uh, scenario. Sure. Uh, and which, uh, which, by the way, is episode two of Inside Job, um, is, uh, you know, reptilians taking over the world. We've got, uh, you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth, and we've got uh, Barack Obama, and, and every other head of state, you know, are reptilian shapeshifters running the planet. I mean, I, uh, I I went and saw him speak once, and I left there so terrified. <laughs> what? I, I've never, literally, I, I remember leaving the Santa Monica Civic Auditorium just, like, like in fear. Uh, right? But, but is, this, is this a likely uh, scenario that is, is, is playing out, that reptilians um, have... Uh, infiltrated uh, heads of state and countries going back hundreds of years, and this is their own agenda uh, that is playing out. With people that you have interviewed, have you had any indication that this is actually taking place? Not of anybody that I've interviewed, but some people that that I have talked with who were in either government positions or things like that said, the weirder it sounds, it's true. If it sounds so, so crazy, so upside down, we just want to let you know that it's probably true. Now because it's, because there's so many, there's so much strangeness out there. I mean, when you really, I mean, you've, you've delved deep into this stuff and you know how much is out there. Well, I mean, you I, know I, way more than me. Uh, the, 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 what, I'm, what I find uh, so fascinating about this is that I have talked to so many people, uh, some that I know really well, that have encountered uh, people that they know that shapeshift in front of them. Yeah. 
which would right. indicate you don't know what you are walking past when you go down the street. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. I've had a few people tell me that they saw, uh, just like standing in a la- uh, line at a Starbucks, they saw uh, the woman in front of uh, them. Uh, my friend was a psychic. And she was just getting these not such good vibes of the lady in front of her. And the lady turned around and her eyes shape shift to reptilian. Have you seen the video? Uh, somebody's going to pop this up in Twitter. Have you seen the video of uh, the uh, Russian talk show with the guess that her eyes go reptilian when she blinks? Have you no. seen that? No, no I want to see that. Now, this isn't uh, this isn't CGI. This is an actual thing that happens. And I don't know with her if she's just got some kind of crazy muscle control and she was born with this ability to change the shape of her pupils and her iris like that to go full cat cat's eye reptilian. Right. Um, right. Or if there's something else. You know, she's got reptilian DNA or... Or she's a, a an amazing hybrid, but the video was real, and it's pretty fascinating to see this play out on camera and to see uh, the reactions from uh, the two people that are doing the interview. It's a- incredible to yeah. see. Wow, yeah, I I've never seen it myself, but uh, I've just heard all of the various stories from you know people that it's happened to. Now, um, so. How many different types of reptilians are there? I've I've heard descriptions of human bodies, reptilian head, reptilian bodies, full tail, uh, yeah. different colors, different sizes, twenty feet tall, uh, five feet tall. Yeah. Uh, it just just yeah. it, we have everything. We have everything. We have we have uh, brown scales and scoots. We have uh, different like green and brown. There are some that are multi-colorful as well, like a chameleon. Some are have that chameleon skin that can blend. Um, uh, so there's it's it's just endless. If you can think of it, it's out there. What somewhere. have you What have you encountered yourself personally when it comes to reptilians? I haven't uh, encountered anything uh, reptilian-wise. I mean, there was a period of time where I was uh, about to release my first book, uh, The Autobiography of an Extraterrestrial Saga, I Am Tehran, which actually, weirdly enough, came out on 11-11-11, right? And for the months leading up to that, I was uh, bombarded with... um, uh, dream states and upon waking, uh, when you're awake and your, your eyes are still closed, seeing, uh, reptilians and that kind of thing. And I, and I realized what it was is that it was there to scare me to not release the book because the book is really about the benevolent universe and, and what to expect through, through a whole story, through the lead character, which whose name is Tehran, uh, who's a commander, right? And so, uh, who's a Pleiadian Titan, a Nordic. So, um, so once, but once you know the book came out, a lot of that just sort of subsided and uh, that kind of thing. So, so there's a you know there's a lot of psychic attacks and things like that I went through way back when. And um, a lot of people um, that are doing the work that I talk to, uh, I know one, one woman who is constantly attacked by reptilians, constantly attacked. So the so. imagery is used as intimidation? Is that what you're suggesting? Which would make a lot of sense. Yeah. So just, just to stand there and stare at you with such hatred and, and, and intimidation um, to scare you because it is frightening. You know, imagine waking up and your eyes are closed and all of a sudden you see this image in your head. Who is projecting that image there? Right. I'm not projecting it there. Right. Right. It, it's being projected to to frighten me, to scare me, 
to not release what I was going to release because, I mean, it was many, many years of putting together and working with uh, these master teachers and all of that, you know. So it, um, uh, I mean, those times were, I, I remember it, but I just kept moving forward and uh, like everyone else, you if, know, who's if, doing it. If, if E.T. does a big reveal here, depending on which which race it is, of course, but right. if E.T. does a big reveal, are they going to have to hide their real selves, you know, to keep us from freaking out? Would they just well, appear as humans? Well, humans, humans would just come as themselves, right? But, no, but I mean, reptilians, if reptilians step off of the ship, they can't reveal themselves to the planet as reptilians that's going well, to be a bad let, scene if it if it was a benevolent reveal i would i would venture to say it would be only humans and then the rest of the universe would be slowly integrated mm -hmm. into society as people come to accept more and more and more and learn about all of the different races out there in the universe, right? Like, like this book. I, I didn't come up with the idea for it. My book agent called me in early 2019, and he said, "I got a great idea for a book." And I got the, I got the uh, name. Of, I got the name of it, the Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. He goes, "You're the man to write that book," because he knew, you know, he'd read all my other books of all the races and everything, and all of. Uh, all the years that I'd studied all the contactee cases who were meeting face to face with all these extraterrestrials. So, so um, anyway, I said, yeah. So I did a proposal and he sold the book in four days. Let's uh, take our break right here. Our guest tonight, Greg Campabasso. We're talking about his new book. It's right here. The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. When we come back, it's all about the Nordics. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal Guard, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Why is it we're not very good with our health regiment? until it's too late. We don't put oil in the car until the engine blows up. When the body's out of balance, your health is not so good. Give your body some love. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Try our Life Change Tea, which cleanses you from harmful intruders. A clean colon is one of the ways to bring the body in balance. We also carry organic supplements to help you get where you need to go. So do your body a favor. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. You can even visit our sales page to save some dough. Uh, does anybody call money dough anymore? Anyway, if you're looking for short, helpful health tips, go to YouTube and punch in Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. So, log on to GetTheTea.com, shop, get balanced, then learn some cool tips at Health Matters Now. You'll be glad you did. That's GetTheTea.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I only drink Fade to Black Blend Coffee from River Moon. Just click on the River Moon Coffee banner at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Promo code F2B Blend. This is the only way forward. This is Fade to Black. Make contact. When you're in the house for longer periods of time, you can see them flying or running across the floor. Ooh, yuck. They're unhealthy, gross, and disgusting. Bugs. I loathe bugs. We keep a clean home, but occasionally bugs show up. Well, I found something that is tougher than bugs. Orange Guard. On contact, it kills hidden bugs, including ants, roaches, and fleas. Plus, Orange Guard is a residual repellent. All of the ingredients of Orange Guard are on the FDA generally recognized as safe list. Orange Guard may be used around food, humans, and pets. It comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Orange Guard, 
Available at OrangeGuard.com, Whole Foods, and Ace Hardware. Gold loves chaos, uncertainty, and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about the stock market? We can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure. United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Craig Campobasso is with us. Tomorrow night, Hollywood, Hollywood. Halloween, Halloween ghost stories, Hollywood ghost stories uh, with uh, Jim Harold, And then Wednesday night, of course, is our eighth annual Halloween special with Shaw the Loon Witch. Thursday night is a special fader night with Race Hobbs. He's going to be joining me on the show. Of course, we're going to be taking phone calls. We're going to be doing all of that. It is fader night, but he's here to announce the UnX Network. And that is our week uh, tonight, Craig Campobasso is with us. We're discussing his new book. It is The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. It is packed. Everything. Uh, illustrations. And this is um, uh, something that I, I brought up with uh, Craig at the beginning of the show. It's very simple to say uh, grays, reptilians, Nordics, and hybrids. Uh, no, there is so much more to discuss than just that because each species, each race has got probably – an infinite amount of versions of, of a thing. Craig, if you and I, if you and I, uh, you and I look nothing alike, right? <laughs> We're both human. But uh, if you and I took a bunch of our friends, right? We grabbed, you know, Lori Wagner and, and uh, Yvonne Smith and, uh, you know, and we, we just jet out uh, to a planet and step off the ship. They're going to think that we're five different species, Right? Sure. It, exactly. We look exactly. nothing alike. Right. Right. You know, Absolutely. And and it, it has to be the same thing. And now, when when it comes to Nordics, um, well, okay, let's let's stop right there. How many different versions of Nordics? Uh, 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 when you're when you're doing interviews, it's just not one typical it, Nordic. It's it's well. It goes back to the supposedly to the very beginning of the universe where the Nordics uh, came out of Lyra or Lyra, however you want to pronounce it. And then when um, and then they went out into settlements into Vega, the Pleiades, Sirius um, and kept sort of going out. So everything is sort of a. Um, evolutional time for these beings and then skin colors and things like that can also change dependent on the velocity of the suns that some planets have a different sun so this is where we get a lot of the pigmentations is there an um, etymology to nordic um i think uh uh 
I think what we think of Nordics is if we go back to the mighty Thor, mm -hmm. we go back to the sort of Norse gods and and things of that nature, and and you know we have a Valiant Thor. Right, mm -hmm. that that we all know that story uh, right behind me, mm -hmm. and um, uh, you know who came here, and he looks very Nordic as well. Um, so, uh, but Nordics usually have a, a different look to them because they're tall. A lot of Nordics are at least seven feet or taller. Um, and, and some of the women can be even taller than the men, or they can be, you know, it's just like here, all the sizes sort of uh, go up and down, dependent on who the parents are. Um, but a lot of those beings, too, uh, are in the fourth dimension and can still travel into this dimension, right? Right. Now, what's interesting is if a soul has sort of progressed through all the dimensions, they can digress and go back and step down and go back in and do things. And sometimes even when they become a, a little bit older, uh, I mean, an older soul, like let's say if they're in the 12th dimension and they want to come back to the third to help a world or a planet, they can shave off a part of their soul and they can incarnate into that planet with that portion of their soul. And then they can look after that soul because it is them to help raise it, to help do what they want to do for that planet. It, it's similar to uh, the Starseed program that comes out of Melchizedek and the University of Melchizedek and the Mira system. So... So Nordics really, uh, and they, yeah, just like all races, there's good and bad, right? There's um, there's offshoots, there's renegades um, that just don't believe in um, uh, being unified in in mind, body, and spirit with your fellow beings. And what's but what's unique and what's beautiful about being unified is. If we were unified and I was sharing a story with you, we would be telepathic. So we could either voice it or we could do it uh, telepathically. But what I would do at the same time is I would share my feeling body with you and you would feel and experience what I experienced exactly how I experienced it. So now you have the full sensory perception of what my experience was and and you now feel more compassionate towards my experience because you got to experience it and you now have that little bit of an upgrade from that experience and if you were to share with me it would be the same thing so What's beautiful about being telepathic is that there are no secrets in a soul. And it's interesting because when uh, uh, Dr. Frank talked about Valiant Thor, when Valiant Thor looked at me, he could look, he said, he looked so deep into my soul, it scared me because I didn't want him to know my secrets. But then I realized that it didn't matter. He loved me for who I was, no matter who I was, right? And August Roberts, who took the photographs of Valiant Thor, had the same experience as well. So, and another man who had interaction with a created being that I, that I spoke with, he had the same experience with that created being who came and taught him for a span of about eight months in 44 different sessions. He came to just teach him all about the universe. And, um, uh, and when he was a young man, he's now in his 70s, and he's preferred never to come out and talk about it um, because he just feels that the, these were, those were his uh, that that was personally for him and for his soul learning. Now, is there a case, uh, you know, we've heard so much about this, uh, of Nordics among us, 
Nordics walking down the street. They are here on this planet, and yeah. you have to look twice to recognize them. If they are seven foot tall, they would stand out. But are there Nordics? Are, are there, there are. truly Nordics among us, like right now in the millions? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't think that there's millions of them here, but there are definitely Nordics here that are that would be more along six foot, maybe, you know, to six foot four, six foot five. Um, I know in my life there were twice where I saw somebody and I knew that they stepped off of a craft. I just felt it in my bone. It was just the way they looked and the way that they looked at me and uh, that kind of thing. It, it, it was, I, I mean, it was such an experience I can't even describe. And it's like, they knew that I knew, right? And, um, and went about their day and gave me a little smile, like you recognized it and, you know, that kind of thing. I, I even captured a picture of two of them um, in a restaurant in Sedona, and I, I recently remembered it. It was during the second harmonic convergence, and it was a Nordic man. He had long blonde hair to about here, and, um, and it was just me and my three friends at one table sitting outside. It was like on a veranda, a veranda overlooking Sedona, and then him and this other girl, um, and... Um, they were very Pleiadian, like if I were to categorize them, I would say that they were Pleiadian. That's exactly what I immediately thought. And I had my camera and I was like, I am not going to miss this opportunity of photographing them. And so I got up and I positioned my friends this way so I could shoot over their heads and get their pictures. And right when I did it, I could feel her energy try to... Um, ruined the film in my camera. And I said, no, please don't. And then she stopped. So I was able to get a couple of photos. The guy's feet were huge. I mean, they were just ginormous. And when they left, they couldn't get, She, he was having a great time. She was extremely nervous. And um, he was the one who was eating. And she, she didn't eat. But she couldn't get him out of there faster. And when they left, they got on a motorcycle. And that was a sure tail sign for me because they usually will ride a bike if their craft is way out in the desert or somewhere remotely. They will, they will use a motorbike to travel. I think it was Fabio. It was a heat. I think like it was Fabio. Fabio. <laughs> I went. I went to Fabio's house uh, a, a few times. I hope he's listening. Um, his house in Beverly Hills, top yeah. to bottom, every room, ginormous, beautiful home, full yeah. of motorcycles. Oh my god! Every my... room you walked in, the hallways, the kitchen. It, there were hundreds. Wow. Inside the house, he was a he was a motorcycle hoarder. It, it, wow. it, it could be its own TV show. Um, so yeah. it's confirmation. Fabio is a Nordic. Fabio is a Nordic. Fabio. Yeah, my my casting partner Joy Todd was. Uh, I think she had cast him in something. And one day we were casting a movie down by MGM, and and we were in a restaurant, and Fabio was over there. So we went over and said hello and. And that kind of thing. So they they knew each other very well. Was the restaurant uh, was the restaurant Chin Chin? It wasn't Chin Chin. No, okay, no, right. it was it was over uh, by um, Culver Studios. Okay, he loves Chin yeah. Chin. I've eaten there yeah. with him. Um, yeah, it's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> Enough of the Fabio talk. <laughs> <laughs> Fabio's a uh, now um, the. The the other part uh, for me when it comes to Nordics is that it seems it seems that they make sense, and the reason why they make sense is DNA, our DNA, humans, Homo sapiens, you and I, Craig, uh, right. humans, DNA is perfect. Two arms, two legs. You know, uh, we, we can run. We look good. We, you know, we're a perfect design. But right. it has to be universal. Why wouldn't there be 
Nordics or us all, all over the universe because it's just right. a, it's just a good design. And if we go back to George Van Tassel, the two yes. Georges, right, Adamski yeah. and Van Tassel, right. um, were, were they Nordics that they were interacting with? Well, they were they were considered Venusian, mm -hmm. but the Venusians and the Pleiadians primarily, because wh what we know as Nordics are primarily uh, Pleiadians um, from all of the things that I've researched, is I think that they're sort of interchangeable. They may have been from the same root race, right? And and continued, um, you know, just continue their evolution so that they do work very well together. Um, the descriptions are just too similar to me. It just seems like yeah. Ger George Adamski was just uh, describing a Nordic that we know today. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and we have though we have those uh, those two, and then um, Thor. Valiant Thor, those were all, the other two were earlier in the 50s, and Thor came in 57. Right. So we had these sort of Nordic-looking Venusians, um, because it, it was said uh, that before Thor's call here to come and teach our government about the universe and about the detrimental things that, were, that they were do, every, the world is doing to the world, is um, that he he had to wait for a very long time, so he did live on the interior of Venus as well. So a lot of people think also that he's Venusian, but I'm not sure if he's Venusian or if he's Pleiadian or if he's even that because a created being is different than an extraterrestrial because they are either created from the Godhead or the universe, if that's what you want to do, boom, you're on the inner, boom, you're on the outer, right? Mm -hmm. And now you go and created beings are angels in human form who are assigned to sectors of the universe and that when there are uh, disputes, they, they go and they're the ones that, that handle those disputes and they go and they do all of the hard work that needs to be done during, uh, you know, whatever their uh, sector is. So I believe that this sector was Valiant Thor's sector, and it still is because he's still here, and that won't he won't go away until the whole world transforms and we move from a dualistic society into a fully conscious society. Now, uh, and there has been a lot of descriptions. Uh, yes. I want to know what you have found out in your interviews um, that Nordics speak our language. They eat our food. They dress like us. Uh, they, they look like us, right? Uh, for all indications, they can uh, make their way into society without uh, being too suspicious, right? If they, they speak the language, they, they eat the food. They can. Uh, Valiant Thor, when he ate food, he had, um, they were about this, this big, and they were white spirals, and he would drop it into water, and it would fizz, and then he would drink that before every meal because it removed whatever bacteria or anything of the food that he was eating here on Earth, especially during his three years at the Pentagon. Um, actually, Dr. Frank gave me some of them, and I, I remember, yeah, he gave me some of the spirals, and uh, and I tried one. I mean, I, I it didn't feel any different, you know, it didn't have any taste, it didn't, uh, you know, I didn't feel that it uh, did anything different inside of me, but... Um, but this is what uh, Valiant Thor always did before any meal that he would have here on Earth. Like yes. before McDonald's. Before McDonald's. 
<laughs> and Jack in the Box. Yeah, yeah, Jack in the Box. <laughs> I don't know. That Jack in the Box late night menu is uh, is a gift from the Venusians, uh, too, as yes. well. Yes. Yeah, tacos. Uh, but uh, wait a minute for a second. Uh, so Just, like a like a quarter of an inch, right? Like a quarter of an inch, and they were like a little spiral. And and they fizzed. And they fizzed, yeah. They fizzed not like an Alka Seltzer, but you would see the particles like pop it, out, like dissolve. It, it wasn't like a fizz fizz, but they would just dissolve and then he would drink the water. Have you ever had these tested? No, I haven't. Actually, you know what? Lori Wagner and I were going to get them tested a long, long time ago. And um, I don't even know if I have them anymore. But I think I gave some to her. I'm going to have to ask her tomorrow. Well, you know what? She's texting me right now. Hold oh, on. good. Well, tell her. Hold on. She's, been, her. Texting me th she's been texting me throughout the show. Um, okay, hold on for a second. Do you still have the white, fizzy, Valiant Thor capsules? Question mark. <laughs> She's probably listening. Oh, she is, and and of so she is. Um, I'm just letting her look. Look, these are the texts coming in from Lori tonight. <laughs> She's and the best. Is, and what is she saying? Um, She's not texting me. I'm feeling very bad about that. Uh, now, I, Lori you, know, Wagner. you have your special relationship with Lori, and so do and I. So do you. And That's so do I. True. You know, I it, it's so funny. Last night, uh, her and I were talking. And uh, she's in Sedona right now. And and I said to her, I mean, it was just like the day before she's somewhere else. And the day before, she is just always out always. there, you always. know, getting stuff done. And she said, uh, um, I, I, I don't want to give it away, but she was with a couple of friends out there and they they had an experience. And so we were talking about that last night on the phone. And uh, um and I, th I think she is so special. And, and I know that you guys hang out a lot. And in yes. fact, a few times that you, know, you and I have talked this year, you were yes. always with Lori, it seemed. Yes. Um, but uh, she she is a very unique um, individual for a couple of reasons. One, she's out there trying to figure things out. Yeah. She's trying to get to the bottom of this this high strangeness. <laughs> Uh, that that is the world that we live in, and that's one of the things I, that I appreciate uh, about Lori. She's like, man, something happened, I, you know, and or I get these texts, and she's yes. sending me pictures, and 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 she she's she's just fun to hang out with. She's so much fun to hang out with. I mean, I love her so much. She's just like my bonded sister for life. Yeah, totally. I mean, and, and, oh my god, and, and I think today she's at the Grand Canyon. Um, oh God! I mean, so what one. what a day! She goes, yeah. I think I'm going to get up tomorrow. I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to go from Sedona. I'm going to go check out the Grand Canyon and, th and then oh. head back home. And this is what I said to her last night. Okay, look, Lori, I'm just going to throw you under the bus. This is what I said to her, Craig. I said, Matt, you know what? I need to hang out yeah. with you. I need to go to Sedona. Yeah, I want to go yeah. have experiences. I want to go to the Grand Canyon with uh, Lori Wagner. She goes, come on. But you're always doing the show. I said, you know what? Technical difficulties week. I can there already go, I, I'll, right? I'll put the post out and uh, let's go uh, <laughs> on the road. Let's go on the road with Lori Wagner. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we usually go and just rent a big house. Everyone gets their own room. It's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm I'm waiting for the reply back. I want to know what. Uh, it, so you don't know if you have these capsules anymore. You think Lori's got them? I would have to look. I I remember giving some to Lori a long time ago too, because she was gonna get them tested. Right. And um and until I I haven't even thought about those spirals. I don't know why it came up because you asked about the food. You know what in Nordics? Uh, right, we were talking about that because. We were That's talking about Craig, Craig. We were talking about Valiant Thor. And before we get right. to the break, because when we come back, Craig uh, doesn't know this yet, but he's going to stay with us because we're going to talk about the movie Dune. So he's not going to bed just yet. Um, but Valiant Thor, uh, he's still here. He's still here. And he he's here for the whole transformation of the planet. Right. So. 
Um, I mean, he was coming here well before 57, but his official capacity started in 57. Mm -hmm. And that he is here with his entire complement. And, uh, you know, he built a... Um, a uh, what do you call it? A starship that was that is seven miles wide and fourteen miles long, uh, where there's a whole complement of beings throughout the universe that are on it that are above uh, above Earth, and that uh, in and around Earth there are uh, Victor class saucers. Uh, that are 300 feet in diameter. Each one holds 200 people. Um, people can see the blueprints to it in the poster on strangeratthepentagon.com under book and DVD. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, and it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, they're huge. They're like double, it's, it's double deckered, but they are stationed at 280 some locations in and around and above the earth and they're monitoring everything. They have the capacity to monitor um, uh, all of the wavelengths of people on the planet, meaning if somebody is going to do something horrifically bad or is contemplating it or is seeing it, they can observe it and then they report it, and then they're told what if they're uh, supposed to take action. Is a Valiant Thor still interfacing with Washington D.C. like he did in '57? You know, I would venture to say since he's been here this whole time, he—I don't know if he's interfaced with every president, but I would assume that he would. And my feeling is, is uh, when he was here. NASA was just getting its 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 foothold, and he did. Uh, he was at NASA quite a bit, and he helped with the regulation of their spacesuits. And um, Dr. Frank also told me with some kind of medication so the astronauts didn't get sick. And um, I believe, weirdly enough, this is just me. I believe he still is there. It has in he, some kind of capacity. Do you know if he's aged? No, no, they don't age because their their whole their their whole environments are um, are regulated. So they they um, it's like uh, re, they call it a resonation field. So on board all their crafts on the interiors of planets. It's all with a resonation field that keeps their cells totally rejuvenated at all times so that they never age. So even though some of them, some of the ET humans could be two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 years old, right, they still look the same unless they want to alter their appearance and start to look a little older. They can do that as well. It's up to them. It's their choice. Right. But um, but a lot of the different races will have, you know, a 2000 year span, a three or four or five. Some can live on uh, for more. But usually each planetary sphere has been given a time frame to learn what they need to learn if it's a 2000 year span. Right. And then in that 2000 years, they can learn and then they can come back out and then decide what their next experience is going to be. Will it be back on that planet to learn some more, or will they go to another planet, be a different species, and start learning uh, from them as well? So um, all planets are schools, and we're, this is what we're in. We're all in a giant school. Right? Fascinating. And here, fascinating. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Let's take our break yeah. right here. Let's take our break. Our guest tonight, Craig Campobasso. And when we come back, we're going to talk about Dune. Uh, as everybody yeah. knows, it was released on Friday night. I watched it twice this weekend. And of course, this is Dune 2021. Fantastic movie. But Craig worked on David Lynch's film for four years. So uh, what did he think of the new Dune? We'll talk about the old Dune when we come back. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with Craig after this short break. Stay with us.
Vivica Fox here, and you are listening to my boy, Jimmy Church, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Despite popular opinion, reading a book will not make you smarter. But listening to Jimmy Church will. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and I take Life Change Tea supplements every single day. It's what I do. Click on their banner at jimmychurchradio.com. When you take the beans from Central America with dashes of Indonesian and African mixed in and then roast it to the dark side of Fade to Black, you create the ultimate brew of fringe. Introducing the Fade to Black blend from River Moon Coffee. Yes, River Moon's darkest customized roast was created for the love of Fade to Black. The alchemy of masterful roasting and smoking the beans is in every sip of this full-bodied dark java. I need my coffee dark, deep, with distinct bittersweet chocolate highlights, just like the bunker. Leaning further into the darkness of the roast is Fade to Black Blend from River Moon Coffee. Just click on the banner at jimmychurchradio.com and use the promo code F2BBLEND for 15% off of your order today. This is Billy Carson with ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. Forbidden Knowledge TV has just reached its one-year anniversary. That's right. One year, and as a show of appreciation, we are giving all new subscribers a free 30-day trial of ForbiddenKnowledge.tv. That's 30 days to binge watch thousands of movies, documentaries, conferences, workshops, lectures, yoga classes, meditation courses, and so much more. So log on to ForbiddenKnowledge.tv from your computer or mobile device or get the Forbidden Knowledge TV app on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon, iTunes, or Google Play today and use coupon code 30 days free. That's coupon code 30 days free on ForbiddenKnowledge.tv today. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were born this way. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Welcome back. Fade to Black. I am your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Craig Campobasso is with us. We're doing overtime. And you, you got to get the book. Here it is. The Extraterrestrial Species Almanac. We just scratched the surface uh, with uh, the content uh, that is in this book. And the links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. But I have to get to the movie Dune. Um, uh, Craig worked uh, with uh, David Lynch on uh, David Lynch's version of uh, of the movie, and I'm just going to ask you straight out, uh, Craig, what did you what did you make of Dune 2021? Well, I back when uh, I was just out of high school, and I got a job on Dune as a production office assistant, so. The first year, it was just me, David, Rafaela De Laurentiis, the producer, and two secretaries, right? So you get to know everybody through then. I didn't know who anybody was. I was like a kid from the Valley out of school, right? And so so it was a really great learning experience, and I, I really just sort of watched David and that kind of thing. But... I was able to view all of the problems that our version of Dune had that they couldn't do, like a lot of the visual effects. Originally, John Dykstra was on the movie, 
and him and Rafaela got into a fight, which was, in, in my opinion, should have been mended because the visual effects would have been very good because he had just done Star Wars, right? Right. So, um, so, so they couldn't do the blue within blue. Um, for the longest time, Val Kilmer was in consideration of playing Paul Maud Dib. And um, uh, in fact, Val, myself, and Rafaela went to some little crazy science, science guy who poured molds into our eyes and was going to make blue within blue lenses and put them in us to see how they worked. But uh, they wouldn't work because the eyes couldn't breathe and you couldn't leave them in the actors all day long, right? Um, so, so a lot of the things in Dune to cut corners were you would see Ron Miller's actual airbrush picture as a backdrop, right? Uh, not an Albert Whitlock painting because... You know, Albert Albert had done already so much, and I don't know what his workload was, but these movies keep getting more and more expensive. I don't even know what it cost in the end to make Dune, but it was done at a studio's Chabusco in Mexico City. Um, but by the way, not only were myself and Rafaela and Dino working on Dune, but we were also working on Conan the Destroyer at the same time, both films shooting simultaneously at a studio Cherubusco in Mexico City, right? So if you're looking for Grace Jones, you went to a Dune set, if you were, right? You know, that, that kind of thing. So, so I, I had always thought, like, right when Jurassic Park came out, I went, oh my God, look what they're doing with visual effects. And wouldn't it be great to see what they could do with Dune now, how they could create that world and, and make it, um, you know, the way that it was intended to be. Um, there's, I still love our version of the film and I love uh, Denis' version as well. And I saw it on the big screen at Warner Brothers at a screening where Denis spoke, uh, the director, afterwards. And he was talking about certain things. And w the problem with our Dune is David had six and a half hours of film, I think maybe even seven. And you couldn't make a giant movie. It would be more like a mini series. And so... My where my office was right across was the editing suite. And I do remember a day towards the end where Dino was there with um, uh, Anthony Gibbs, our editor, and David, and they were doing the moviola. And Dino was just saying, you know, cut the cut, the cut, the cut, the cut, the cut, the cut. The cut. And you could just see David going crazy because he's he cut all the Fremen out, right? There were actors down there who were there for four to six months who were reduced to an extra, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, so Denis' version, he did it smartly. He ends it with Paul and Jessica entering the Fremen society so that there's a part two where then that can be finished. That part I loved. Of course, all the visual effects, I mean, were just incredible. But you can't beat Bob Ringwood's costumes in the original Dune compared to the new Dune, right? Yeah. Um, Bob Ringwood's costumes, I mean, they were unbelievable. I remember Jessica, just seeing them. Jessica oh. was majestic. Yeah. Yeah, Jessica I mean, was a majestic. And well, look, I didn't I never had the issues that uh the critics had with with Lynch's Dune. I it, right. I was never offended and it seemed like um that the uh Hollywood didn't want to like uh David Lynch's movie. It wasn't David it wasn't because of David Lynch. Everybody felt that Dune could ever make it to the big screen, and therefore this was going to be a failure from the word go. Well, but I'll, but I'll time, time has, has definitely shown 
that Lynch is Dune is a spectacular movie. Um, it is. It's the costume design. It's the set. I think he did the best that he anybody could have done with the dialogue and the story. Um, Frank Herbert's books are are giant. You know, so how? That. Yeah. Oh, look. Signed yeah. by Frank Herbert himself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool, man. That's pretty cool. Um, but I, I, I loved uh, the, uh, David Lynch's version, of which I've probably seen it a hundred times, and I'm not exaggerating. Yes, it's, it's good. What What happened, as I recall it, way back when is we, after production wrapped in Mexico, uh, everyone is back at Universal. Universal was trying to sneak into our editing bays and see some of the film, and David didn't want to show it to anybody until it was ready. So we moved off the lot, and we moved into a, a building called Vandeveer Photo Effects, and they're the ones who ended up doing the um, uh, visual effects. So... So we had the whole upper floor as our production offices when, with the uh, visual effects company downstairs. So it was good in that sense that everybody was in the same place. But at the time, there was a changing of the guards. And uh, how I heard it is that they were friendly with Sid Scheinberg. And when Frank Price came in, Frank and Dino didn't get along and that because they weren't showing advanced screenings or anything, everyone got out of sort. And, and that's when all of the bad press started coming out and that kind of thing. And when you, when you look at it, back then, I tried to read Dune and I didn't understand it. I, I, you know, with who I was back then. And, and when I saw David's version of it, of course... I, I was like, oh, I get it. I get it. Right. And so and then, of course, throughout the years, reading it and getting into, you know, Frank's mind about uh, the whole world of Dune um, really came together for me. Uh, but um, the there there's. Uh, so that's where all of that bad press started. And then some of the press started saying, oh, they have to explain the movie with yeah. Princess Erlen in the beginning. Mm -hmm. By the way, that was Universal's idea. It was not David's. That's how I remember it, mm -hmm. because that was never there. And they had to go in and reshoot that thinking that they had to do it. But if you look at Denny's version, Chani kind of does the same thing. Yeah, 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 right? definitely. So yes, 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 you, yes, yes. You yes. do have to take a little bit of those licenses for people to understand what the hell is Spice and what does it do. Well, um, right? I mean, oh, okay, now I want to talk to you about uh, uh, Dune 2021. And, yeah. and I'll tell you one of the biggest, if, if there is a contrast between the two films, um, and I'm just talking about characters, uh, uh, Francesca Annis, uh, the original Jessica. Um, Lady Jessica in David Lynch's film is strong, stands upright, and is a leader. Regal. Uh, regal. And, yes. and uh, the costume has a lot to do with that, by the way. But anyway, yeah. And, yeah. And, and she's beautiful. Um, Jessica in Dune 21 is... I want to say almost forlorn or melancholy, it, it almost yes. uh, defeated, and it's it, it, the exact opposite of the way David Lynch and I, I, I and I think the way that Frank Herbert had always intended Jessica to be a very strong uh, yes. uh, figure. Uh, did right. you did you see the the contrast uh, in there the two was, Jessicas? There, there was, and um, and the costumes on Jessica were downplayed, even even when she came off the ship. Uh, you know, when she's in the gold, which was really beautiful, and uh, that kind of thing. But uh, was definitely, you know, Denny did not go for that that version of it, and everyone's performances were were really um, understated and internal. Right. Because um, I think that's how the book sort of reads internally. Um, and uh, but 
I mean, I liked uh, in in David's version. Uh, I really uh, I love Timothy Charlemagne and I love Kyle, of course. Mm -hmm. They're they're two totally different performances, and I like them both. Right. I, I like them both. It's just a director's choice on on which way to go, or and, you know, in conjunction with the actor. And uh, but I um, but I I hope in part two that we do get to see the emperor and fade and you know uh, some of the characters that were missing. But um, I can see why they were left out because there was already too many, and you don't want to confuse the audience. And you could bring those in later because uh, you know the emperor was mentioned and. Uh, you know that kind of thing, but the visual effects were just a wow. I mean, you know, they, it's it, it reminded me of Arrival, his other film. You know that sort of tone uh, with the ships and the different things. And did that, you like but, did you like Dune twenty twenty one though? I did. I really did. Yeah, so did I. Yeah, I really really liked it a lot. I mean, a lot, a lot. So. Um, this is what happened to me. I I, I, I didn't know, um, and I thought that I had been following uh, the production of Dune pretty pretty well and what was going on. They did a great job of hiding that this was just a part one. Yes, I, they did. Nobody, they did. nobody, yeah. you know what? Anybody that says that they knew this in advance, no, I bet I, I stayed on top of it. And and this is what happened to me. I'm watching the movie and I'm about three quarters of the way through and I'm thinking to myself, how are they going to finish this film in 30 minutes? Right? Wait, 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 it's too, it's too far along. There is no way. And, and that's when I really got interested how Villeneuve was going to somehow get to an act three and finish the film in 30 right, minutes. Right. Right. And 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 then I started to realize, wait a minute here. This is like Peter Jackson. This is just a part one. This has got to be a trilogy. I waited until the film was done, and then I checked out the internet. And sure enough, did right. you know that this was part one when you were I watching did. the film? I did, because I, I follow all of the Dune um, things, including uh, Denny's uh, hashtag on Instagram. So I did know that it was part one and the film was released all over Europe and did really, really well in the box office over there. So they, a lot of it was, you know, let's keep the momentum going so we can make part two, right? And, and part two, I didn't understand at first what they were meaning. I was like, are they talking about Dune Messiah, the second book? Right, 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 right. right you know, right, so right. I wasn't really quite sure until I read more and more posts as they were coming out that it was part two of Dune. And I actually thought that that was brilliant because um, that I, as I saw that uh, there was no way that we could have done it. David couldn't do it. And that's why, you know, you missed all of that Fremen stuff. Well, well, well I want to see Paul Atreides ride the worms. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I was, I exactly. Was, you know, and so all of that, uh, the entire uh, uh, second two thirds of the first book were not in the film. So you've right. got the entire training uh, before the big battle, of course, uh, with the Fremen. Uh, you have the reveal of the uh, of the oceans um, on Arrakis. And and what that means to Paul, and and what goes on with the Fremen. That's a huge part. That's Act Two, and that right. is where uh, you know we're not getting to Act Three, which is you know the battle for Arrakis. So all of that, I'm wondering if that's how he's going to set it up. That there's going to be the entire Fremen uh, reveal with Paul um, and Jessica, and then of course, uh, uh, act three must be, uh, part three of the films has got to be, uh, the battle for Arrakis. Well, it's not only that it's, it's now going to see what they're going to do with Alia, the, 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 uh, his sister, because, uh, the actress that played her was Alicia Witt, you know, who grew up, 
you know, starring on Sybil and uh, mm-hmm. lots of other TV shows and movies. And, um, and it was always that she was a child with a woman's voice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so that's why her voice is a little strange in Dune, because I know that they tried dubbing it many different times and it just didn't work. So it's going to be really interesting to see what they do with it in the sequel. And right. uh, any word about uh, uh, you just mentioned uh, what Villeneuve was saying in his hashtag that we got to keep the momentum going. I would have thought if you're going to present it this way that he would have taken from the Peter Jackson playbook and he was shooting part two and part three at the same time. Well, you would think that, but I, I don't think that. Uh, that Are we going to have to wait I, two years for part two? I I think uh, that you are, and I haven't heard any word. I mean, Dune, uh, on its first weekend, only made 40, 40 million, right? So it didn't do like 80 or 90, which I think what they were hoping. Um, so, so I don't know. I guess it just depends on what the worldwide box office is and, and really what that movie cost. I have no idea what that movie well, cost. Well, I thought that they did $100 million in Europe before uh, uh, the launch on the 22nd. I thought they already right. went over $100 million. Yeah. Yeah. Well, going over $100 million and what they've spent on uh, print and advertising and all of that, you know, they, they spend on movies – uh, sometimes is uh, you know half the budget or more just uh, for that because really where they make their money is a merchandising. Now, what did you make? Okay, let's go back to the characters uh, for a second. Yeah. What did you think about Jason Momoa and and Duncan? Loved him. I, I did loved too. Loved him, and I loved uh, Richard Jordan as well in the original. And and I went on to hire him in uh, other films as well. He was a great guy. And uh, um, uh, Brolin, Josh Brolin. Brolin was great. He was great. He was great. I thought he did really good with Gurney. You know, we had Patrick Stewart before Star Trek. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, one of the most iconic scenes uh, from David Lynch's film, of course, is is Paul and the Box, right? Yes. With the Benny Chester yeah. at Witch. Um, right. and to, there were a lot of scenes actually that Villeneuve did that were pretty, pretty close, close to David Lynch, right? Why break it? I mean, if, if, why fix it if it ain't broke, right? Okay. Well, it, it was, it was true to the book. It's is, it, is see what that, he did. Yeah. Uh, let, let's, uh, uh, okay. Yeah. I, I don't want, we're almost out of time. There okay. are reasons why David Lynch's movie was so great. You go and you read the book and you're like, well, crap, man, David Lynch didn't do anything. It's right off the pages of the book, right? Right. <laughs> and, right. And, and the same thing with Villeneuve. You can't mess with that. But right. that scene, Paul and the Box, I was waiting for that scene. What did you make of it? What did you think? Well, well Sean Phillips, who is a brilliant British actress, played the original uh, uh, Benny Jesuit, uh, Benny, Benny Jesuit, like Helen Mohim, blah, 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 goes on and on right, her right. names. Um, and interestingly enough, she was married to Peter O'Toole and they had all their children together. Um, I stayed in touch with Sean for probably 10 years after uh, Dune. Um, if uh, me being a casting director, if I were to have chosen a current person to play her, Charlotte Rampling, you can't get any better than that. The performance, she's never going to mirror Sean. Sean was just, Sean did Sean. And what we don't know is uh, um, what performance that the director wanted her to do. Etc. I thought that Timothy did really great in that scene as well. Kyle did great in his scene. They were both little. They were both varied, right? Um, but the one thing that we saw from Charlemagne is that he had more anger towards the Benny Gesserit witches, and it was all done through tone and expression. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Like yeah, when yeah. that was done, he could have killed her. And right? there was, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, when he says to her, you, you just, you just kicked my mom out of her own house, right? Yeah. And uh, standing up to her. But um, uh, what was interesting, okay, we're, all, we're out of time. But what was interesting for me was that David Lynch chose to show the inside of the box, right? And yes, and, and yes. burning flesh. Right. Villeneuve chose to go with the mental aspect of it and yes. and what the pain was going through. Interest, interesting choice of the director. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. And and they both worked actually. They they both worked. I mean both both thing worked. I mean, you know, we're used to the original and we've seen it a lot, so it's really burned into our mind. But but Timothy did a great, brilliant job of portraying the mental pain and stuff. But I did love how it was written in that Lady Jessica was feeding him telepathically about fear is the mind killer for him to overcome it. And he overcame it. Yeah. From the other side of the door. Yeah, and, yeah, that and, was great. And that was brilliant. The other choice uh, that I thought was interesting was David Lynch uh, had Sean pull her veil back and show her face, where yes. Villeneuve chose to have her face have covered. It. Right. Interesting. Yes. Interesting. Very. You know, and they both yeah. work for me. Um, uh, Sean scared the crap out of me uh, from oh. the original version of the movie. It's so good. It's so, it's good. so good. So good. So good. <laughs> Intelligent. Uh, her um, her look um, yeah. uh, in David Lynch's film was just brilliant. And yes. and Villeneuve chose to go the opposite and uh, and and keep her covered. Uh, Craig, what a great show, man! We could do David That's Lynch so all night fun. long. I could we sit. Can. I, 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 he's never made a bad movie, and oh, I love all his movies. his influence on me. I, I can't tell you how many times I've said, you know, I'm driving down a freeway in the dark with my headlights on, and and I'm I, my we're in a David Lynch movie. <laughs> you know, that's the influence he's had on me. Thank you so much, uh, thank Craig. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, thank you so much. And the book, uh, everybody, the links uh, are at jimmychurchradio.com. I've also got a link up there for strangerinthepentagon.com where you can go and look at all of the material and watch uh, the short film, too, as well. Thank you so much, Craig. Be safe in your journeys. I never thank heard. You. I never heard back from Lori. I, I my last text is I need to know before the end of the show. So I ha- she's either on a hot date or went to bed, <laughs> <laughs> and I think she probably went to bed. <laughs> Craig, have a great night and be safe out there, my friend. You too, man. Thank Take you. Take care, Jimmy. Bye, Cra- everybody. Craig Campobasso, and again, the links are over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Get the book; it is a fantastic read. It's right here. All right. With that, I want to remind everybody, uh, tomorrow night we're doing Halloween stories, Halloween ghost stories with Jim Harold. All right, so you're not going to want to miss that. Fade to Black is produced by Hill J. Palm, Renee, Dennis, and Kevin. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldridge. Intro, Space Boy, spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2021 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll see everybody tomorrow night, Halloween Ghost Stories with Jim Harold. Until then, everybody be safe. It's time to fade to black.